talk about this etude today. I started by writing the etude for a student, a very good Barry Sachs student of mine, and I started by basically writing it in our lessons without writing anything down. And then once we had the whole thing memorized, I did write it down and began practicing singing it and uh, visualizing the fingerings. And then continuing to play it on my instrument and I've played it now for just over six months or so maybe a little longer and probably played it a thousand times I imagine maybe more and uh, it's a very nice way to learn and I recommend everyone have some sort of etude they're working on it could be a transcription one course transcription uh, from one of your favorite artists from either the 50s or 60s, which I always recommend focusing on the players from that era because that's most of the players that we all love are, have studied the music from the 50s and 60s, so that's what I always recommend. And uh, sticking with the etude until it's fully memorized, until you can play it as easily as you could play Donnelly or Confirmation or any of the bebop melodies that you've learned over the years, you can play it in the presence of an audience, other players. In other words, you fully know it. Uh, you could write it down from memory. You know every note in relationship to the harmony of the moment. And I'm going to show you uh, how I like to practice this when I'm playing. And, and this is a hard thing to teach students, but thinking of the harmony while you're playing, uh, it's a hard thing to demonstrate because you can't be in my mind while I'm playing. And the thought of the harmony is somewhat abstract. It's almost like a sound, a shape, uh, and a thought, if that makes sense. It's almost like an image. But I'll try to do my best by just saying the chord out loud before I play the melody. So the first melody is on E half diminished to A7 flat 9, D minor, D7, G minor. C7 flat 9 F major B flat 7 A half D7 G minor B flat minor C7 F major E half to A7 flat 9 D minor, D7, G minor, alt, C altered, F major, B flat 7, A half to D7 flat 9, G minor, B flat minor, C sharp minor, C7, F major 9, e, uh, B half to E7 flat 9 to A minor, B half E7 flat 9, A minor 6, A7, D minor, G7, C major, G minor, E half to A7 flat 9, D minor 6, uh, B flat major to C7 to F major, or G minor C7, F major, F minor over the B flat 7, D7 flat 9, 
B flat minor. Uh, sorry, G minor to B flat minor. C sharp minor to C7. F major, sharp nine. E half to A7 flat nine. So that's what's going on in my mind. Uh, the saying of it out loud is reminiscent of how I'm thinking of the chords, but it's more of a knowing the chord and it's a shape and an image and a sound and then the melody is the chord itself. So at a certain point, the thinking of the harmony and the melody becomes one thing. The melody is the harmony. Um, and so, yeah, the rhythm is the lens through which we play the harmony using melody. So it's hard to put into words, but I still think it's important to try to do so as a way of communicating ideas to other people and uh, making sure that you know how each chord and how each melody note relates to that chord. So not just knowing, for instance, what the chord scale is that the melody comes from, but each of the notes how it relates to the chord. And that, just just playing it slowly, thinking of the chord, and then maybe thinking of the numbers, how it relates, um, however you need to do that. But doing it slow enough so that you can really know every single note of an etude or a transcription and how those notes relate to the harmony. Eventually it all becomes synthesized into one thing. It's just the melody, which is a you know synthesis of the rhythm and the harmony. Um, and it just becomes something you audiate, you hear in your mind, and you play it, becomes self-expression, just like talking. It's a talking with sound, talking with melody. All right, I hope that's somewhat helpful, and I'll see you on the next one.